Good morning. My name is Maggie Hartley, and I am the Assistant Director of Public Engagement here at the National World War II Museum. We are so excited that you guys have joined us for today's Lunchbox Lecture, which is entitled Weird War II with Rusty Nix, a World War II enthusiast and the former communications manager for the Virginia World War I and World War II Commission. So without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Rusty to share some of these unique and bizarre stories that he's discovered over the years. Hi, everybody. It's good to see everybody here today. I see we have a lot of folks um, already online, over 100 people already and growing. Fantastic. I'm glad you could all be here. Like Maggie said, my name is Rusty Nix, and I am the former communications manager for the Virginia World War I and World War II Commemoration Commission, now a stay-at-home dad of a tiny tanker, a tiny history nerd herself. So um, today we're going to get in and talk a little bit about some of that history that I love so much and that I'm sure you all love just as much or else you wouldn't be here now, would you? So today's topic that we're going to talk about is indeed called Weird War II. And this is a personal favorite topic of mine. Weird War II, the incredible, inconceivable, inexplicable, and outright odd stories from the weirder side of the war that you thought you knew. So let's go ahead and dive in, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go. World War II was, without a doubt, the most defining moment around the globe of the 20th century. This six-year window in our world's history has spawned countless stories of heroism, bravery, tales of survival and sorrow, and delivered even more messages of empowerment and triumph. But even in these darkest hours of the war, people were still people. And you know, as well as I do, when it comes to people, there's always something new, fantastic, bizarre, and amazing to learn. Right here is just a little bit of a preview of what you're gonna see. Strange things, soldiers with bears, restaurants that will close in case of invasion for half an hour, filling tanks on airplanes with beer, and yes, that's right, armored donkeys. Let's take a look and see what other weird things about World War II we're gonna talk about today. Starting off with one of my favorite stories, a story about Staff Sergeant Joseph Barrel. Now, Joseph Barrel, if you've never heard of him before, he was 101st Airborne. 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. He is a D-Day vet. He jumped on June 6, 1944 and was captured by the Germans. Beryl specifically was trained as a demolitions expert. That was his entire shtick. He was designed to go behind lines, sabotage um, specific crossings, bridges, anything that would slow down the German advance to the beaches. As Beryl was making his way through these, he was captured and then sent to Stalag 3C as a POW. Took him several tries, but he eventually escaped. And when he escaped, he realized something. He was a POW deep behind German lines. So far, that in fact, it was easier for him to run east as opposed to running back west to the rest of his unit. So he ran to the Russian army, figuring that they were allies and they might help him get back to his unit. He ran east and eventually met up with the First Guards Tank Army and Tank Commander Alexandra Semeshenko. Now, the great thing about Samoshenko is she knew a little bit of English. So when this random guy shows up there claiming to be American, um, people were really suspicious, you know, an American doesn't just show up on the Eastern Front out of nowhere and ask to be taken into your custody. So while they were suspicious at first, she was able to converse with him enough that she believed him and said, all right, if you say you are POW, take me back to where you were held at and we'll see if we can liberate that POW camp. So he did. He took her back to the POW camp where he was being held, and they went ahead, liberated the camp. She believed him. Everybody else did, too, from that point forward. And she said, hey, you're going to Berlin. Your people are going to Berlin. We're going to Berlin. Why don't we all just meet up there at the end and we'll get you right back with your guys? So he did. He rode along as their tank crew's official demolitions expert, clearing out obstacles along the way for them and the rest of the First Guards to make their way through. Uh, eventually, he's wounded in action. He was sent to a field hospital where none other than Marshal Zukov of the Red Army himself shows up. And Zukov decides that this guy really needs to get back home. So he pulls some strings, does some paperwork, gets him sent back home to his unit in France, where immediately they think that he's a Russian spy. Because why else would you be coming from the Eastern Front? So they interrogate him quite a bit. But they eventually decide, you know, maybe this guy's telling the truth. And they're like, you've seen enough action. Let's go ahead and get you on home. 
So he returned home in 1945, much to the surprise of his family who thought he was dead for over a year. He would live to be 81 years old. There's a picture of him in that bottom corner um, taken just a couple years before he passed. You can see his American medals on one side of his vest and his Soviet medals on the other side of his vest, making him the only person to ever serve in World War II in both the American Army and the Red Army at the same time. A little fun side note, when he actually did pass away, his kids told an antidote at his funeral and said, we're half expecting to uh, dad to walk through the back doors right now. So we're going to take a little pause here just in case he's going to tease us and show up at his funeral one more time. The next story we're going to jump into is the Phantom Fortress. Imagine this, November 23rd, 1944, at an RAF airfield in Belgium. You're on an AA crew, and all of a sudden you hear a lone B-17 approaching. You look up in the sky and you see this bomber that looks like it's smoking and looks like it's having a little bit of a trouble coming in for a landing. The tower radios the bomber to ask if they need assistance or if they need to clear, but they don't get anything back. They don't hear any response from the bomber, thinking maybe, you know, their radios have been um, fried or shorted out or their electronics are down. So they scramble fire crews and get ready just in case the worst happens. Well, after a semi semi-rough but still successful belly landing, the plane ended up sitting quietly on the runway for 20 minutes, but no crew emerged from the plane. Strange enough, right? Eventually, the ground crew investigated and they discovered the truth. There was no one on board this B-17, not a soul. Now you're probably thinking, how does a plane come back and land on a runway by itself? Sheer luck. After taking light damage in a bombing raid that likely severed his fuel lines, the bomber had lost two of its engines trying to make its way back home across the English Channel. The pilot of the particular uh, B-17 Phantom Fortress uh, decided that it was easier to turn around and go back to Belgium since they were leaking fuel badly. He turned the plane back around towards Belgium and thought that maybe they could make landfall. That's when the second engine went out. The pilot panicked, set the autopilot, and told the crew to bail out. So the crew bailed out over the English Channel. The plane, however, continued flying back towards Belgium and all the way to this RAF airfield, where it landed almost perfectly on the runway by itself. When the crew finally arrived back in England after being rescued, they learned that the bomber had already landed hours before them in a totally different country. And as a fun fact here, did you know, um, it's not necessarily fun, but I'll be putting in these little extra did you know facts as we go through. Did you know that more U.S. servicemen actually died in the Army Air Force than in the Marine Corps during World War II? The next story we're going to hop through, like I said, we're going to be hopping through a lot of these because there's a lot and they're all really fun, is the Megalomaniacal Magician. I love alliterations, as you probably have already guessed by the title of these slides. Jasper Maskelyne, Stage Magician. He was a magician in the uh, 1920s and 1930s, and he prided himself on being one of the greatest illusionists with mirrors of all time. He joined the uh, Royal Corps of Engineers in 1939. Um, how he got involved, though, is he decided he would tell the War Department that he could be a personal benefit to the war effort by using magic to fool the Germans. He convinced the officers of the power of his illusions by seemingly making a German World War I battleship appear and disappear on the River Thames right there in London at command. He did it with scale models and mirrors, but still, that's how he did it. And it was a good enough ruse that they agreed that he would probably be of good use during the war effort. So he would later go on to join MI9 in North Africa. He created escape kits with saw blades and maps secretly hidden, you know, like in combs and pins and personal effects like that to where the Germans wouldn't find them on inspection. His illusion was really good, but he wanted more, he wanted bigger. So Maskelyne claims extravagant feats in his own memoirs about making dummy vehicles, inflatable tanks, making whole companies of soldiers disappear as a ruse to an actual attack, camouflaging the entire Suez Canal and moving entire cities in the blink of an eye at night to protect them from German bombers. He loved perpetuating the myth of his own genius. Now, how much of all of that actually happened and how much of it was actually his idea is up for debate. He says everything happened and everything is up uh, was his idea. But a lot of other history books say no, that it wasn't necessarily him, that it wasn't necessarily his idea. And the reason for that is he would later be all but renounced by the British military for his ego because he wanted credit for every one of those things that happened. Just him, not even his unit, not even his team, just him. So they renounced a lot of what he did. 
he went on to be a better, very bitter alcoholic um, who left England and moved to Africa in his later years. Uh, but his feats, were they, did they happen? Did they not? Some of them are crazy. Can you make the Suez Canal disappear? Depends on who you believe. If you believe Jasper, then yes, he definitely could. The next thing we'll talk about is the underwater wonder. This is personally one of my favorite things in World War II. I think the Germans get a lot of credit for, uh, are given a lot of credit and a lot of screen time and a lot of books and publications on their wonder weapons of World War II, you know, like the V-2 rocket or jet aircraft or all these new fancy fangled things that happen. But some other nations had wonder weapons of their own, if you will, including Japan, which is one that not a lot of people realize. And that is the I-400 series of submarines, Japanese super submarine I-400. This picture that you see here on the screen is from the I-401, which is the uh, second boat to be built in this exact um, line. It is an aircraft carrier submarine. Yes, you heard that right, an aircraft carrier submarine. Constructed in 1943, completed in 1945. Uh, the I-400 was the largest submarine of World War II at over 400 feet long, which put it in the same size class as some American destroyers, if not a little bit bigger even than some of them. Uh, the I-400 was unique because of their large guns, the excessive amounts of torpedoes, and because, like I said, they were aircraft carriers. As you can see right there underneath the uh, tower on the submarine, there's a long tube, and this was the uh, loading tube where they would lift up these seaplanes. It held three um, seaplane fighters that could each carry a small amount of bombs and they would wheel it out on the deck and the wings think much like American aircraft at the time that were on carriers would then unfold and then snap down onto the bodies of the planes and they would launch off the decks with a catapult. They would come back because they were seaplanes land next to the submarine and as you can see right there uh, in front of the tower in that first picture again there's a crane that would pick them up set them on the decks they would fold them up slip them back inside sink under the water and would be gone. The ultimate stealth aircraft carrier of the time. Each of them carried three fighters strapped with these bombs. And these planes were, or these planes were designed to go on one specific mission. They were designed to be carried in these I-400 series subs, the I-400 and 401, all the way to the Panama Canal. They would then be launched as a group and these six planes would take their bombs and bomb the locks of the Panama Canal. Now, obviously, we're not talking about heavy bombers here, so they only have small-ish bombs that they're carrying with them. But these bombs would have been absolutely devastating on the locks at the Panama Canal. If they had been able to jam the locks, think about what would happen then with the American um, naval bases over in New York, Virginia, trying to send their ships around through the Panama Canal, only to have to go all the way around South Africa. It would have delayed supplies, troops, reinforcements, new ships, everything by weeks and weeks and weeks. And while it wouldn't have changed the war, it definitely would have prolonged um, naval presence, the ability for the Navy to get their things into the South Pacific for weeks to come and drug out the war even longer. As you can see in that last picture that I posted there, that's an Iowa-class battleship, the Missouri to be exact, going through the locks of the Panama Canal. And you can see that there's only maybe about two to three feet of clearance on either side of that ship as it squeezes through the narrow locks. So that was the only option for these uh, big ships to get through to the South Pacific. Not having the locks would have been a huge detriment to the Allied war effort. But thankfully, that didn't happen. Both the I-400 and 401 were intercepted en route and surrendered. Um, both subs went on to be studied extensively by the U.S. Navy and then were scuttled off the coast of Hawaii. And as a matter of fact, they just recently found them in the last few years, again, the location where both subs sank and rested to. Next up, we'll go back to talking about people for a minute. The medieval madman, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, a.k.a. Fighting Mad Jack Churchill. Jack Churchill was a British Army officer who fought with British commandos during World War II with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Yes, you heard that right. My friend here went into World War II with a broadsword, bagpipes, and a longbow. As a matter of fact, he saw combat with these weapons in France, Norway, Italy, Yugoslavia, and Burma. Not so much combat in Burma, but he did get there. Uh, he is confirmed to have the last official record recorded wartime kill with a longbow in history, a 1300s weapon wielded over 600 years later. He used it to secure a machine gun nest in France, uh, running up on them in the middle of the night, um, 
he shot a sentry with the longbow that was standing up, uh, having a smoke break. And after the sentry dropped, he grabbed his broadsword, ran, jumped in the machine gun nest with him, pointed the broadsword at the other Germans, scared them so bad that they were terrified of this crazed man with a sword pointed at their heads that they all surrendered. And he captured the machine gun nest and marched the prisoners back to the rest of his unit. He himself was captured in Yugoslavia, but he eventually escaped and walked all the way from Yugoslavia to Italy just so he could find an allied unit to rejoin to get back into the war effort. They patched him up and they sent him over to Burma, and by the time his plane landed, the war was over. And he is quoted as being quite displeased with the Americans for, quote, ending the war too fast. As he said, if the Americans hadn't have been involved, we could have kept this thing going another bloody two or three years. That's his words, not mine. He's crazy. He just loved fighting. And as you can see in this bottom picture here, I enlarged it so you can see right there in the front, jumping off the front of this landing craft, you see a man in his full World War II gear, but also carrying a broadsword in his right hand. Yes, friends, that is Jack Churchill. Next up is one of my favorite stories. Now, my goal with this presentation today was to tell you all something that perhaps you never have heard before or had no idea happened. A lot of people have heard those previous stories. This is usually the one where I trip up most people. Most people have not heard this one yet. The Feminine Fuhrer. So during and before World War II, Adolf Hitler found himself the target of dozens of failed attempts to assassinate or remove him from power. There have been countless books written on this topic. There have been movies made about it, documentaries made about assassination attempts of Adolf Hitler. But the question becomes, um, with Adolf Hitler, how would you be able to take him out of power without assassinating him? Could you do it possibly more peacefully? Could you make him remove himself from power? Well, in desperate times of war, there was no limit to what the Allied forces would consider if it meant eliminating Hitler and taking him out of the picture. So the U.S. Office of Strategic Services, um, the OSS, carried out probably one of the most wild plans of World War II that I'd ever heard. That's turning Herr Hitler into Herr Hitler. Okay, now you're probably going, what in the world is all of this about? Let's see, the OSS used spies to get close to Hitler's gardener, bribing the gardener to inject Hitler's vegetables with estrogen in an attempt to feminize him. All right, now we need to take a little pause here and a breather and explain their rationale. They thought, the OSS thought, that if we could inject Hitler's vegetables with estrogen and turn him into a woman, that when the public would see his long flowing hair, would see him growing elsewhere and see him becoming more effeminate in speech and actions and voices, that the public would lose interest in following their dictator, that suddenly the macho manly dictator who had helped them win these battles was now turning into a meek and timid housewife. And perhaps the public would abandon following him. Perhaps Hitler himself would lose the desire, the bloodlust for war, and that he would rather stay home and wash dishes like all good 1940s housewives should do. Well, they tried. And as a matter of fact, they actually did more than just try. They did get estrogen to the gardener. They did bribe the gardener. They paid the gardener handsomely. And the gardener agreed to this crazy plan to start injecting Hitler's vegetables with estrogen. The thing about estrogen is it's tasteless, odorless, all of that. So any taste testers would not have caught this as uh, they were going through. Well, unless they started developing feminine features as well. But the question becomes to the OSS, as they kept watching news reports and seeing media, and kept seeing Hitler in public, Hitler was not turning into a woman. Something was going wrong. Well, as it turns out, the gardener simply pocketed the money and continued working for the Fuhrer. Eventually, the OSS determined that his undependability, coupled with a potential chemical imbalance in his mind, was too risky to pursue this further because someone finally stood up in the room and said, hey, wait a minute, if we keep injecting this obviously crazy man's mind with estrogen and then flooding his mind with two different chemicals warring back and forth between the testosterone and the estrogen, holy cow, what are we creating? Are we making an even more unstable monster? So everybody else thought about that for a minute and said, actually, no, you're probably right. And so they abandoned the project in the end. 
but they believe it or not did actually try to turn Hitler into a woman during world war II because they thought that was the best way to remove him from office. Um, yeah, I mean, they made the mistake themselves of trusting the gardener. They told him that it would take months for these to even take effect. So don't worry about getting caught. So he was like, all right, keep paying me for months. I can handle this. It's a pretty cushy job, if you ask me. Next up, speaking of Germany, we're going to stick with this subject and come back to the wonder weapons subject. As I mentioned before, Germany was known for wonder weapons in World War II. We've already talked about them, but here's some of the zanier ones that were created during World War II. And not just Germany, other nations, as you'll see, came up with wild projects. Starting with the Fuckerwolf Triebflugel. This is a jet powered VTOL aircraft, vertical takeoff and landing. It's a defense fighter built to combat allied bombing raids. As you can see, it has like a shark shaped plane fuselage, but it has whirling wings with jet engines strapped to the ends of them that whip around the middle of the body and ignite on fire and are supposed to encircle the aircraft like a helicopter blade as it takes off vertically, then somehow levels out and flies horizontally. This actually reached early prototype phase, wind tunnel designs, things like that, but they never actually managed to get past um, building a working fighter. After all, how do you actually get jet engines that are flying around in a circle at such a high rate of speed to not starve themselves for fuel? A little something they could never get past. But like I said, Germany wasn't the only ones that came up with weird weapons like this. The Americans came up with weird things too, such as the Sherman Crab. It's a flail tank. It's a Sherman tank with a large chain mace built on the front of it. It's a rotating log with chain strapped to it. This is specifically designed to clear enemy mines ahead of the tank, make a path through the forest, clear out underbrush. It gets on the Wonder Weapons list because it looks insane. It looks absolutely chaotic as it drives along, beating the ground with the chains, created a hellacious noise, created a huge dust storm behind the tank. And actually, many German soldiers that saw these in action said in their reports that it was the scariest thing they ever saw. And that while the tank was effective at doing its job and clearing mines, the mental image of having an American tank rushing towards you with chains whipping around to beat you into submission. This is what the chain of command is known as. It's the chain that they use to beat you with till you understand who's in command. Um, okay, sorry for random jokes thrown in there. But um, when the German soldiers saw this coming towards them, they said that was more terrifying than anything else. So it actually worked as a psychological weapon at the same time. Several nations used them, Americans, British, um, but the British version was actually considered the worst because it wasn't operated by the tank's engine. It had a separate motor on the side of the tank, which required a person to sit in a tiny little metal box mounted on the side of the tank in the blistering North African sun getting um, beamed in with heat, sitting on top of an engine, running the controls to make sure that the flail continued to work. Speaking of British inventions, we'll talk about the great Pangendrum. I don't even need to say anything about this. Just look at it. L look at this thing go. Look at it do its thing. It's a rocket-powered autonomous bomb that was meant to deploy from a landing craft and drive up the beaches of Normandy, detonating on impact against the bunkers. It's supposed to just roll straight off, go straight up the beach and hit the bunkers, blow a path, clear a path for the uh, Allied forces on D-Day. But look at it. Look, I mean, it <laughs> going in a straight line was the last thing on the Pangendrum's mind. The rockets sent it careening wildly across the beaches. And hilariously, if you're wondering where this little video clip comes from, the British actually tested it on a public beach at one point in time. And people were just standing around filming it and having to run out of the way from this careening wheel that was going by. There's one shot where a rocket falls off of the thing and is shooting across the ground and a dog is barking at it, chasing the rocket. It's just, it's just a mess. Absolutely chaos. Speaking of industry and manufacturing, did you know that in 1941 more than three million cars were manufactured in the United States, while over the course of the entire rest of the war that there were only a handful that were made for the entire duration. Only 139 were made during the entire war because so much of the Allied war effort had shifted into making um, weapons of war as opposed to automobiles. Speaking of weapons of war, now we're going to switch over a little bit and kind of jump um, to one of my favorite stories of World War II of all time, the bombshell bomber. Meet 
Nadezda Popova, or Nadia Popova, as the English translation would be for her. Nadia Popova was a squadron commander in the 46th Tamman Guards Night Bomber Regiment. You might have heard of this regiment before. They flew antiquated Po-2 biplanes um, that were crop dusters in the 20s that had been converted into bad bombers. Uh, they were really bad. They were really slow. They didn't have any protection. Um, but they were converted into bombers that were flown for night missions in World War II. And she and the rest of the other women in her unit were known as the night witches. <clears throat> they flew these out, outdated um, crop dusters at night specifically on daring bombing raids behind enemy lines, dropping bombs under the cover of darkness and then escaping to go back, reload with more bombs, and then do the same thing all over again. While American bomber crews were typically given leave and even able to go home after about you know, 24, 26 missions, Popova flew 852 sorties during the war. Now, if you're wondering what a sortie is, if you're not familiar with aircraft terms, that means taking off, going out, dropping your bombs or accomplishing your objective, coming back, and that's one sortie. So 852 flights during the war. Her personal record of 18 sorties, 18 missions in the same night has still not ever been beaten since then. Can you imagine taking off, going out, flying over an enemy base, dropping bombs, being shot at by any aircraft guns, enemy fighters coming in to chase you and escaping under the cover of darkness only to come back, load up with more bombs and fuel, and go out and do it again 18 times in one night. I don't think near enough credit is given to the women who were in the Night Witches Squadron. They did incredible things. And as amazing as her 852 sorties is, she's not even the most. There were some that flew over a thousand sorties during World War II in her unit. The things that these women did were absolutely incredible. But after flying a relief mission behind enemy lines, going back to Popova for a second, she found dozens of bullet holes in her airplane, her map, her flight jacket, and even her flight helmet, but not a scratch on her in this one mission. Kind of a, reminds you a little bit, for all you uh, Revolutionary War history nerds out there, about George Washington and having the bullet holes through his coat, but none on him. A little bit of the same, uh, same magic there. Popova, however, um, would go on to be 91 years old. She passed away in 2013, and she was the last official member of the Night Witches to pass away. There is a picture of her um, in 20, uh, 2012, taken just before she passed, with a picture of her during World War II. I'm going to come back to the Russian front after we talk about this next story, because I think there's a lot of stories that don't get near enough credit on the Russian front. So we're going to come back and hit a few more of those before we uh, continue on. But first, let's talk about another British thing, the Frozen Fleet. The Frozen Fleet was envisioned as the next era of supercarriers. The HMS Habakkuk was proposed by Winston Churchill himself as the solution to the plague of German U-boats in the North Atlantic during the early uh, days of World War II. Uh, the U-boats had devastated Allied shipping back and forth between England and the United States, and there really wasn't a good way to deal with them. There were too many of them too fast, so they needed bombers and fighters to be on hand to be able to deal with U-boats. But how do you do that without sticking an aircraft carrier out there that would only be sank by U-boats? So to keep these um, ships protected, they needed a large, massive, invincible aircraft carrier somewhere in the North Atlantic. Hence, the HMS Habakkuk, an aircraft carrier built entirely out of ice. That's right, you heard me, built out of ice. Not only would it dwarf current carriers, you can see in that first picture there a battleship next to the Habakkuk, if you wanted a size comparison. You see it sitting down there in the water. That's ridiculously huge. Um, <laughs> it would hold three times the fighters. Full-sized bombers could land on it, and it was made almost entirely out of a ice mix called pike crete. It's ice sawdust mixture that, when put together, if it took an impact, say, from a torpedo or a bomb or something, while the ice would break, the sawdust would absorb the vibrations and only cause the ice to splinter a little. And with feet upon feet of ice encasing the hull of this aircraft carrier, it would make it almost invincible. With cooling units from these blueprint designs on the inside constantly recooling the outside of the ship, any cracks in the ice would let water in, which would be immediately frozen by the cooling units, and self-repair and self-heal the hull of the Habakkuk. It's a self-healing battleship. How wild is that? 
So it actually entered into testing. They tested it under um, disguise and they made it look like a floating building in Northern Canada during World War II. They made a small scale model of it and it worked exactly how they thought it would, exactly how the blueprints did. And they actually said that it was, it got the green light to go and be a thing and build an ice aircraft carrier, which would have been the start of an entire ice fleet, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, you name it. But by the time they greenlit it, it was no longer needed. The Americans had joined the war effort and had put a lot of their power into protecting the um, shipping back and forth. And at that point in time, the U-boat scourge had been chased off of the North Atlantic. So sadly, we never really got to see an ICE aircraft carrier. I personally would have loved an ICE fleet, but that's just me. Speaking of the Americans and uh, Navy at the same time, did you know that the youngest serviceman who entered um, the military in World War II was Calvin Graham? He was age 12 uh, when he went in. Graham actually lied about his age when he enlisted in the Navy and his real age <clears throat> wasn't discovered till after he was wounded later on. So let's hop back over to the Eastern Front. Like I promised, we get back into it and talk a little bit about the battlefield there. As Polish Second Corps uh, soldiers evacuated from Russia at the start of the war, they stumbled on a baby bear for sale at a train station bazaar in Iran. In order for their newfound passenger to join them legally, he had to be enlisted in the army and given a name and a rank and all of that. So they named him, what deck? The Battlefield Bear. And they actually filled out paperwork and enlisted him. He served with Italy's second corps, uh, their 22nd Artillery Supply Company during World War II. And he was given his own paybook, his own rank, his own serial number. He lived with the other men in their tents. They raised him, they took care of him. And so he was a, just a big friendly companion along the way. However, he also trained with them. And training with them means that he had knowledge that was valuable to his unit. During the Battle of Monte Cassino, Wojtek jumped into duty, carrying 100 pound crates of shells to the front in his arms doing a job that normally would take three to four men to do, earning him a promotion and a celebrity status in um, both Polish, uh, both Poland and in England. As a British soldier who was there at the time um, was uh, noted for saying in his diaries, he said he had never seen anything like it, a bear not phased by the sound of artillery and mortar, but simply carrying artillery shells to supply his men with the needed munitions to fight against the Germans. Amazing story. Uh, just in case you were wondering, he did live through the entire war. Uh, you can even see his units insignia there with a bear carrying an artillery shell. Uh, that came about after the Battle of Monte Cassino. Um, but he lived through the entire war. He was sent to England after the war where he lived in the uh, Royal Zoo in London um, until his death several years later of old age. He was a fat, happy bear. Next up, still on the Eastern Front, we'll talk about the Dead-Eyed Damsel. Uh, Lieutenant Ludmila Pavlichenko, a.k.a. Lady Death. Now, you've probably heard of more famous um, Soviet snipers than this. Maybe the name Vasily Zaitsev rings a bell. You've seen the movie Enemy at the Gates with uh, Jude Law and Ed Harris. Uh, this, however, is different than that. This is a female sniper, uh, Lady Death herself. She was the most successful sniper in history with 300. That's right, 309 kills to her name officially on record. She saw action in the early half of World War II, the Siege of Odessa and Ukraine and the Battle of Sevastopol, um, which is actually the name of a movie that is specifically about her. Look up Battle of Sevastopol if you're interested in watching a movie about her. It's pretty good. It's all in Russian. You're going to need subtitles unless you know Russian. Um, after being injured in combat, however, she became a spokeswoman for the Red Army as a kind of quasi-celebrity in Russian circles. In fact, so much of a celebrity that she actually toured the United States doing campaigns for the war effort, trying to drum up support here in the U.S. for the United States to join the war in Europe and to get invested and to start helping um, what Russia and um, the U.K. and France have been doing for years already. Uh, she actually formed a pretty close relationship with Eleanor Roosevelt, of all people, <laughs> from her time in the United States, and was the first Soviet citizen to actually be welcomed into the White House. Uh, Ludmila Pavlichenko was known for um, saying at a press conference that Eleanor Roosevelt and uh, she were both at on tour, she said, um, gentlemen, I have killed 309 fascists to date, talking to a large crowd of people. I have killed 309 fascists to date. Don't you think it's time that you stopped hiding behind me and joined the war on your own. The American public uh, at first was a little aghast by this, um, this short little uh, Soviet girl telling them to join the war effort. 
but then they gave her a rousing applause and support for her was very high amongst the American people. American media was still not too keen on her. They preferred to ask her questions about what sort of rouge she wore and what sort of blush she wore and what was her favorite fabric for her dresses, to which she constantly reminded the media, I am not here to talk about dresses or fabric. I'm here to talk about fascists and gunning them down. So please, let's focus on the war effort. Did you know also that on the Eastern Front, four of five German soldiers that were killed in World War II all died on the Eastern Front? That's part of the reason why I like to focus a lot on the Eastern Front stories in my presentations, because so much of the war happened in the East that we here in the United States often only focus on what happened in the West. So I like to jump in and tell some of these stories because I guarantee you most of you have never heard them, and some of them are absolutely amazing. Kind of like the vengeful vixen. This is one of my favorite names here, Sergeant Marina Oktobraskaya. Now, Oktobraskaya, um, prior to World War II, she worked as a um, canner in a fish canning facility, then a telephone operator. Um, after marrying an army officer, uh, she joined the Army Wives Council and trained as a nurse and trained in battlefield weapons and tactics. She was actually known for saying that being an officer's wife is a sworn duty that she must uphold and protect. So she thought that um, army wife is an army life for her. And so she trained in all the same things he did. However, unfortunately, he was killed in Kiev in 1941 in action. Marina was enraged, vowing to avenge her fallen lover. She sold all that she had, all her possessions, her house, everything, and bought, personally, a T-34 tank off the factory lines. Fighting Girlfriend, the name of her tank, as she emblazoned on the turret painted on it, fought in several battles in 1943 and 44 with Marina as the commander. Maria actually served aboard the tank, wanting to personally avenge her husband. She served in this tank as the, um, I said commander, that was my mistake, as the driver and also the tank engineer at the same time. She would get out in the middle of a firefight and repair these, the tracks on the tanks if they broke and then get back in and continue driving, pushing forward. They destroyed German MG positions, artillery positions, and eventually after several battles and almost a uh, year of fighting, she was killed in action in early 1944. Uh, while she was posthumously awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union title, her crew continued her legacy and Fighting Girlfriend itself made it all the way to Berlin in 1945, fighting in the last days of the war, keeping her legacy on to avenge her husband all the way up to the end of World War II. But she's actually not the only person who did this, not the only woman who did this, believe it or not. While some people have heard of Mariah, some have never heard of this one. Alexandra Boyko, she purchased a T-34 alongside of her husband, raised the money, purchased this tank, just so she and her husband could crew the tank together. They went on to destroy five German tanks in one week together as a tag team duo, um, continued serving throughout the rest of the war, and they both survived, proving, I guess, the old adage that the couple that tanks together earns ranks together. I don't know. Anyway, another little interesting story there. Let's hop back over to the American front a little bit and talk about things going on on the home front, specifically the bird-brained bomb. Now, this was the brainchild of a famous psychologist and um, behaviorist, which is uh, B.F. Skinner. For any of you psych majors out there, you might know the name uh, B.F. Skinner. He, he developed something called Project Pigeon using uh, classical conditioning to establish and create a guided smart bomb using pigeons. You got that right. Using classical conditioning, these pigeons would be trained to peck at a picture of a particular building and receive food. Now, you're probably thinking, why the devil did they come up with a pigeon bomb for World War II? The answer is actually easier than you might think on this one. Uh, Project Pigeon itself was designed because so many German factories um, had been designed to protect them from allied bombing raids. In other words, they built them right next to a hospital or a school or somewhere where they knew allied bombers and their imprecise dropped waves of bombs would not bomb because they didn't want to risk killing the kids or killing the sick or things like that or, or destroying churches or any anything that would protect a factory. They needed a smart precision bomb that they could drop straight down onto a building and destroy it without having to worry about collateral damage around it. So they trained these pigeons 
to peck at pictures of a building from overhead. Peck at the picture, a little door opens up, food comes out. Peck, food, peck, food, peck, food. And eventually the pigeons got trained to do this. So they would target a specific building with an aerial reconnaissance photo and tell the pigeon, you peck there, you get your food. And then the idea was once they were properly trained and conditioned into this, as you can see in this picture, the bird would be stuffed into a warhead on a bomb. This specific warhead used multiple pecking sensors. You can see in the image, there are three sensor screens that give um, various viewfinders, if you will, of the ground below as the bomb is plummeting to earth. The pigeon would then supposedly look at these screens look at the pictures below and go, oh, hey, I recognize that building. If I peck that, I get food. So they would starve the pigeon for a day or two before this, stick him in the warhead, and then when the bomb was released from the plane, the pigeon would see the building that gives them food. Uh, they would peck it, and as they pecked, it adjusted the fins on the back of the bomb slightly, and each time they pecked one of these pictures, the fins adjusted and aimed that bomb right where it needed to be. Believe it or not, this actually worked. This actually worked. Despite thinking it was crazy, the government awarded him $25,000 to finance this project. And it showed great promise that the birds actually did exactly what Skinner thought they would do. However, the need for Project Pigeon was canceled in 1944 as there were bigger plans on the horizon. Should we say atomic plans on the horizon? But actually, um, Project Pigeon would be revived in 1948 again for a little while, just to see if it was still a valid option, but the Army shoved it one more time. Did you know that the Army also tried tying incendiary bombs to bats in the hopes of causing fires in Japanese encampments? This didn't end well. The Army thought, you know, maybe the bats would go up in the thatch roofs of Japanese huts, and if they carried little tiny incendiary bombs with a timer on them, they would sneak up in there to go to sleep then the bombs would burst and they would catch the whole grass buildings on fire. Sounds good on paper, right? Well, when they released the bombs in their test facility here in the United States, the bats took one look at this very shoddy built Japanese makeshift village on the testing grounds and thought, ooh, who wants to sleep in there? And the bats turned their attention over to the nice clean army barracks of the base and said, hey, let's go roost in there. The US military, you see what's coming. They caught their own base on fire with the bats and the bat bombs. Fantastic, good job guys. Let's not put bombs on bats next time. <laughs> and speaking of Japanese, we're on here to the last story pretty much of the presentation as we go through. And that's the long serving lieutenant. Uh, some of you may have heard of this one before. Some of you may even remember seeing this one in the news. This is second Lieutenant Hiro Onoda. Hiro Onoda was a Japanese national um, who served in World War II and was the last true Japanese soldier to surrender of World War II. Now note I said of World War II and not in World War II. Well, he was on remote Lubang Island in the Philippines. Onoda and three other soldiers were dropped in late in World War II in order to, quote, disrupt enemy operations and to never, ever surrender. He took those words truly and in October of 1945, he and the three others saw a leaflet on the ground that said, the war's over. If you're still fighting, if you're a Japanese holdout and you're somewhere on this island, give up. It's done. The war's over. But they did not believe it, concluding that it was simply American propaganda trying to get them to stop fighting. So they continued fighting, disrupting uh, any American operations on the island, disrupting civilian presence on the island, even actually killing some civilians in the process, too. The first of Inoda's men to leave was in 1949. He surrendered. He couldn't take it anymore. It had been years without orders. 1949, think about it, it's four years they've been hiding in caves on this island without hearing any other word but never give up. He surrendered in 49, left the other two alone. The other of Inoda's um, friends, the other man who was there, was killed in 1954 in an incident with local authorities, local police on the island who managed to um, catch them in the act and in the shootout, he was uh, injured and killed. Um, the next uh, passed away of sickness and disease in 1972, leaving Anoda all alone by himself. In 1972, how many years is this past World War II at this point? And in 1974, 30 years after his arrival on the island, Onoda was discovered, and after being convinced the war was over by his commander, he finally surrendered. 
when they discovered him, um, the person who found him also spoke Japanese and was able to try to converse with him and say, no, 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 no don't kill me. I'm, I'm part Japanese. I understand Japanese. What are you doing? And he said, I'm following through with my orders. And they said, don't you understand? The war ended. The war's been over for nearly 30 years. What are you still doing here? Um, he, he wouldn't believe him. And he said, the only way I'm going to believe you and that I will be able to renounce my orders to never surrender is if my commander shows up here. Well, luckily for everyone involved, his commander was still alive. Believe it or not, he was an elderly man working as a cobbler in um, back in Japan. So they went, they found this guy's commander. They said, hey, one of your guys is still fighting. He won't surrender unless you tell him to. So they brought him to this island and his former commander had to tell him, hero, you come down, you surrender. To which, still wearing his Japanese uniform of World War II, he surrendered to the um, Philippine and American forces on site in 1974, making him the last Japanese soldier of World War II to surrender. And here's a picture of him uh, taken just a few years ago in Japan. Uh, Hiro Noda, when he returned to Japan, was actually um, very embarrassed by this whole thing. Can you imagine fighting World War II 30 years after the fact? I, I can't fathom doing that myself. I did the dedication that he had, and he was embarrassed by this, embarrassed that he had done so much, and he was ashamed that he, you know, had killed people for a war and a cause that no longer existed. But when he came back to Japan, the uh, premier of Japan, president, uh, emperor, he said, you know, of all people, I should be bowing to you because you are an example to all of our next generations of what it means to follow orders, what it means to be a good soldier, to be a good citizen, to not question um, the, to not question your duty and to follow through with these orders. And so we should be thanking you. He, it made him feel better, but he didn't feel like he was completely in the right for everything he had done. So he spent all of the rest of his life, all of the money earned from his fame that he had developed um, for being the last Japanese soldier to surrender. He put everything that he had into um, schools and children. And there's actually several schools in Japan named for him specifically because he invested so much in the next generations, teaching them about honor and respect and doing the right thing and trying to make a difference in the next generation's positive way. So there you go, folks. That's just a few of my absolute favorite stories from World War II, the incredible, inconceivable, inexplicable and outright odd stories that we started out with. In case you were um, wondering along the way, uh, you see right up there at the very top of the screen, that strange uh, cylinder looking device, that's the bat bomb. That's what they put the incendiary bats in. And uh, all of these other great stories that we've talked about today, you can find information on them anywhere out there, but I'm also happy to answer any questions that you guys have today too. Thank you so much for um, putting up with me and my weird stories and weird antics as we go along. Thank you so much, Rusty. I absolutely love hearing these stories. Um, they're so unique and lots of different emphasis as well with weapons to the Eastern Front, to the home front. So what we're going to do now is actually switch to the question and answer section. I do want to remind our viewers today that you can type your questions into the Q&A feature. You can also put them, if you're watching on Facebook, within the comment there as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. You kind of hinted about where we can find more information about these stories. And Brad was asking if you had any books um, that you would recommend. Uh, there are several um, different books that you can look at out there. If you go on um, if you go on Amazon or anywhere online, any bookstore uh, locally, even you might find them. Um, Unsolved Mysteries of World War II is a great one. It deals with some of these stories and um, a lot more, obviously, that I don't have time to, to go into today or even the depth that you can. Unsolved Mysteries is a great one. There's another one called, um, let's see, Bikinis and Sideburns, if I remember correctly the name of it. It's a weird military history stories about the strange military origins of everyday items. Um, some of these books like that are great, and that's where some of these stories come from. And a lot of them, otherwise, you can just find on the on the internet, um, looking around and searching for any of these particular topics we talked about today. Well, it sounds like, and I think some of our viewers agree with me, that you ought to think about writing a book. <laughs> I have thought about it many times. I've had uh, the pleasure of 
spending a lot of time with World War II veterans who've personally told me some of these stories um, in person as well as others. So putting it into a book might not be a bad idea. Absolutely. So a question from Abe is, he's surprised that the Soviets allowed an individual to purchase a tank. So do you have any details of how they were able to get their hands <laughs> on an operational tank? Let's, let's think of it as more of sponsoring than purchasing. So obviously they needed resources, they needed money to be able to build these tanks. And so if you came to the government and said, hey, I'm going to give you a whole truckload of money just to sponsor a tank, can I be on that tank? Sometimes the Red Army would take advantage of these, like for a propaganda stunt which is actually what they thought about um, at first with Fighting Girlfriend with that story when she sold all of her possessions and gave the money to the government and said, can I purchase a tank? Um, can I purchase a tank and uh, then crew it? They looked at it as an awesome PR opportunity to be able to have this fairly attractive young lady driving this tank in revenge of her fallen lover. And it's just this, it's, you know, it's this grand story that you can use and drum up support nationally. And so they went ahead and they rolled with it. And um, turns out that she was pretty good at what she did. Absolutely. So we do have a question from Facebook from Gina. She asked, what was the story that surprised you the most when you learned it? Oh, surprised me the most. Oh, oh boy. There's, I mean, all of them shock me a little bit to some degree. Obviously, I think Feminine Fuhrer kind of takes the cake because who in the world has ever heard of Adolf Hitler being turned into a woman with estrogen through his carrots? Um, that's that's pretty, pretty surprising, uh, I've got to admit. <laughs> so um, I may be mispronouncing this name, but it looks like Ami. Um, it says, thank you for a wonderful lecture and wants to know how did Hiro Onada survive and obtain supplies during those 30 years? Uh, that's a good question. He actually went on um, part of what they were doing. They gave him the orders to disrupt local activities. Uh, so part of what they do, would they would do supply raids. They would actually go into local villages and raid supplies and come back out or into the um, local towns and sneak out supplies and get food and everything that they needed and smuggle them out. They had some areas where they could scavenge for naturally grown foods, but for the most part, what they did was conduct raids to get that. And that's how a lot of civilians actually ended up getting killed were in these raids where they would catch them in the act and then uh, Noda or some of the others that were with him would end up having to shoot them to where they could get away and escape. And that's part of the reason why he said he felt ashamed for a lot of what he ended up doing was because so many innocent people ended up being killed in his quest for continuing a war that ended 30 years earlier. Definitely. So we have a question from Lynn asking about the photo um, of the Germans on the right side with the goggles. <laughs> and uh, this, this question actually ties into um, the, same, the same way that you see the donkey with the Panzer Shrek on top of it. The, this is a good answer for both of these because the Germans were bored a lot of the time. Okay, just like any good soldiers in, in any wartime, there's a lot of time where you're just sitting around. If you were in the military, you know that three quarters of war is just sitting around waiting for the next battle or moving or actually doing nothing. So a lot of times they were bored and the Germans, believe it or not, had a pretty wild sense of humor with stuff. Like you see the picture of the bear in the upper, in the upper corner up here, the bear with the German soldiers. And then you've got the donkey and the Panzer Shrek and the German soldiers with goggles. All of that is out of pure boredom and just trying to do something to pass time to be humorous. There's a lot of that that happened in World War II. Sounds like it. So we have two questions from Lynn and Michael, same topic. Um, do you have any info on the Foo Fighters of World War II? The Foo Fighters, myself personally, that's not one that I have in my, uh, in my collections. I have heard of it a little bit, but I haven't gone over and added it to my presentations yet. Absolutely. Totally understands. I understand you're not the keeper of all of the bizarre <laughs> stories. Of but I try to be. <laughs> you do. And you do a great job of that. We Thanks. have a question about something about the Italian army stealing a Sherman tank from the U.S. Army. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> that one I don't know, but it is... Um... It is not surprising. Italian tanks in World War II were pretty terrible, let's be honest. The idea was they were infantry support, 
um, that was designed in the 20s and early 30s, and they never really advanced beyond that. Italy didn't have the uh, capacity to build large armored vehicles like Germany, um, England, the United States. They were an agricultural country, so they just simply didn't have the capacity and the resources to build big vehicles. So it is not surprising at all that they took one look at a Sherman and said, that's literally eight times the size and armor of my tank line. We're going to take this. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me one bit. So George asked if you could tell us about the chilling beer in the Mustang drop tank. Excellent. Uh, looks like a Mustang. It's actually a Spitfire in this particular picture, but that is exactly what it is. Chilling the beer. Okay. See, they decided, a, a brewery decided during World War II in England that they wanted to help boost morale on the front to the boys that were serving on the front lines. So what they would do is they would detach what you see in that tank. That's an external fuel pod meant for long range missions. They could bolt on the bottom of Mustangs, Spitfires, things like that. And then um, once they bolted them on, they would carry extra gas so they could do long range missions. Well, in this case, they rinsed them out real good, filled them with beer, strapped them to the bottom of these uh, Spitfires and would fly them out to the front to these frontline air bases as close as they could get. And when they landed, being flown at 12,000 feet for that amount of time, the beer was perfectly chilled, ready to be served on tap for the guys as soon as they um, turned off the engine. So it was a great way to deliver beer, uh, courtesy of a brewery back at home, also got a new fighter to the front lines, and hey, made the guys on the front happy. Absolutely. So... Another question, you know, there are a ton of questions and I do want to say, <laughs> we're not gonna be able to get to all of them today. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us here at the National World War II Museum and we can get them to Rusty. Um, I also want to let everyone know that this is being recorded and it will be live, <laughs> it'll be um, posted onto YouTube um, by the end of this week and it will be available to rewatch on Facebook immediately after the conclusion of this program. So do not worry, you will be able to share it with many teachers wanting to share with students and even share with family and friends. But one of the last questions I have for you, Rusty, for today is, do you have any info on the Night Witches stealing aircraft early on in their beginning? Ah. One of my favorite subjects here, the Night Witches, I have, I actually have, Maggie knows this, I have an entire presentation just on the Night Witches that I do because I love them so much. And they did do that. They actually had to finagle and bus to get a hold of everything that they had at the beginning. Uh, when they were issued uniforms at the beginning, they were issued boots and men's sizes, uniforms and men's sizes. They literally had to stuff with padding everywhere just to make them fit to where they wouldn't fall off their um, small frames while they were in these airplanes. They were given these terrible aircraft at first, these POTUs, which most of them continued flying for the rest of the war. Um, but then several other units, not specifically their division that Nadia Popova was in, um, several other all-female bomb units that kind of splintered off of the night, which is did do some finagling to get a hold of some PE-2 twin-engine fighters and fighter bombers that made a lot more of an impact on their bombing missions. Um, but none of them, even with those better planes and their other subunits, none of them had the same success rate as the actual original night, which is um, group, that fighter group, the Tamman bomber regiment they were the best of the best and they served more missions than anyone else combined and had more um orders of the hero of the soviet union orders which is basically kind of think like a light version of medal of honor um they had more of those awarded than any other unit in russia during world war ii absolutely so the last question i'm going to ask you and it piqued my interest because it's a uh, recent news type feel as well. But Sam asked, do you have any info on UFOs during? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, UFOs, isn't that a fun subject? Um, well, think about this. Uh, a, lot, a lot of what you see as UFO sightings in the 50s and uh, the 40s and the early 1950s that happened because there was a big rush of UFO sightings. If you look at the timing, the early 50s and the late 40s, even the mid-late 50s, um, there was a lot of UFO sightings that just got a spike out of nowhere. 
And a lot of that comes from the weird, wild designs that America and Germany were experimenting with. Uh, you have like the Horton 229 flying wing that doesn't look like any other aircraft. It's just a flying triangle in the sky. You have the experimental American flying pancake, which was literally a round airplane with little engines on the front that flew along. So you had these weird shaped silhouettes that made strange noises, especially with pulse jet engines like the V-1 bombs. Um, jet engines themselves that a lot of Americans have never heard of. So this whistling sound and this triangle shape comes flying over your head as they're testing these new designs. It's no wonder a lot of UFO sightings started right after World War II. But there were also some strange, unexplained events that happened during the war that I would suggest looking at some of those books that I mentioned earlier because you might find some pretty inexplicable stories there as well. Absolutely. So Rusty, again, thank you so much for joining us today. This was fascinating. I always learn something new from each of your programs. <laughs> well, I am glad to be here. It is my humble duty to um, spread the knowledge and spread the weirdness of World War II. <laughs> Absolutely. And I want to thank each and every one of you guys for joining us for today's Launchbox Lecture. If you enjoyed this programming, I encourage you to like our Facebook page, to stay tuned for upcoming programs, and also check our website regularly as we're adding lots of programs both in person, on site here in New Orleans, and virtually um, on a regular basis. Now take care everyone, and we look forward to seeing you next time here at the National World War II Museum. Thank you.